The Bane Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, time travelers diverted from killing Hitler and watching the crucifixion by the grumpy cat blockage of the drains of the multiverse in the 2000s. Middle Kingdom quakes and dowsing rod shakes, plus we continue the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's uncompromising honor. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor, Tony Daniel. This time we have the first of a multi-part interview with David Weber and Jacob Hollow. They are talking about their big new time travel space fighting novel, The Valkyrie Protocol. David and Jacob discuss the characters, all taken from various timelines and universes, and the amazing setting of twisted universes, and the excellent story, which involves the Black Plague and an even scarier black hole in time itself. So that's coming up. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Hey, it's a big Weber podcast. Now here's the news. Don't forget the October post-apocalypse ebook sale. It's a big John Ringo ebook sale until the stroke of midnight on Halloween. Save big on John Ringo ebooks. Save $2 per ebook. In John Ringo's Black Tide Rising original series, save $2 on Under a Graveyard Sky, To Sail a Darkling Sea, Islands of Rage and Hope, and Strands of Sorrow, plus $1 off on all other John Ringo ebooks. All of them, everywhere Bain ebooks are sold, these prices apply. Sale begins Saturday, October 3rd, and runs through Halloween. Woo! That's a ghost. The October mass markets are pouring forth from their cavernous slumbers like the bats of Carlsbad and the chocolate from the coal mines of Minos 4 to booksellers everywhere. Now in mass market edition is 1636 The China Venture by Eric Flint and Ivor P. Cooper. The newly formed United States of Europe sends an embassy to the Chinese Empire for many all-important critical resources nobody has ever needed before at least not before an entire town showed up from 300 years in the future. But convincing the mandarins to establish trade with the newly formed USE won't be easy. Also at Booksellers in Mass Market is Target Rich Environment Volume 2 by Larry Correa. More stories from the creator of Monster Hunter International, the Grim Noir Chronicles, and the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. The second volume collecting all of best-selling author Larry Correa's short stories, novelettes, and novellas. Correa delivers short stories that pull no punches and take no prisoner. Finally, now out in mass market paperback is The Cunning Man by DJ Butler and Aaron Michael Ritchie. It's the depths of the Great Depression and a mining town in Utah is shut down. Something has awakened underground. And now a monster roams the tunnels. Along comes Hiram Woolley, a man with mystical abilities derived from the common sense application of Scotch Irish folk wisdom and German rocker magic. The Cunning Man by DJ Butler and Aaron Michael Ritchie. Target Rich Environment, Volume 2 by Larry Correa, and 1636 The China Venture by Eric Flint and Ivor P. Cooper are all available in mass market editions at booksellers everywhere. And when the mass market comes out, that means the ebook price goes down too. So check these out for some great October reading. This is part one of a multi-part interview with David Weber and Jacob Hollow talking about the Valkyrie Protocol. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. I want to welcome David Weber and Jacob Hollow to the podcast. Hello, folks, guys. Hi. Hello. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you back in Technicolor this time. 
Mm. Um, David Weber is the creator of the Honor Harrington series, the Oath of Sword series, and, well, about a billion other series, including <laughs> one called The Gordian Division. There are more than 8 million copies of his books in print, and 33 titles so far have made the New York Times bestseller list, um, according to uh, Marla Ainspan here, our tabulator. And she should know, yeah. She should know. Um, who is the associate publisher at Bain, by the way. He's collaborated with many excellent authors, uh, including Starfire on the Starfire series with Steve White, the Empire Man series with John Ringo, the Multiverse series more recently with um, Joel Presby, Linda Evans before, the Ring of Fire series with Eric Flint, um, among others. And uh, that's just to touch on some of the things that David has done. And now the Gordian Division series with Jacob Hollow. Jacob Hollow graduated from Youngstown State University with a degree in electrical and controls engineering. Go he is the goodness. author of eight books, including two Gordian Division novels written with David Weber. Between novels, Jacob enjoys gaming of all sorts, whether video gaming, card gaming, miniature war gaming, or, or watching speedruns on YouTube. He is a former Ohioan, which is a very difficult thing to say, by the way. I practice <laughs> a former Ohioan. Well, you realize I was born in Cleveland. <laughs> you are a former Clevelander. I am a former Ohioan Clevelander. Very former in my case. <laughs> former Michigander who now lives in South Carolina with his wife boss and his cat boss. Um, and out now at Booksellers Everywhere is the Valkyrie Protocol, which really looks cool when I hold it up because it's green. <laughs> it's very ghostly well, yeah when you look at it yes yeah there you go so Ooh. i think this is um i think it's a really nice cover um tony foiled it this time and, and foil doesn't always work but mm. i think in this case it really looks cool and, and time travel-y um time travel-y yeah you just made that word up no <laughs> No, I think you use it in the book. No, oh, no, we do not use that word in the book. It. And it's got a beautiful. Although Raper uh, probably would. <laughs> that's a cool Dave Seeley cover that you've got as well, which with a cool time traveling spaceship, which appears in the book. Um, well, let's let's. Can we talk about where we are? Uh, we started. This is the the follow up to the Gordian uh, Protocol, mm -hmm. and uh, we start this book with a wedding of sorts. Um, well, it is a wedding, and it's a it's a, a wedding's sort of like one of these end of time uh, people from multiverse shows up kind of things. Can can we start talking about that and uh, bring us up to speed on where we are when the book starts? Well, we we'd originally written it with was it completely without the wedding scene, or was it just much later in in the book? Yeah, the the, the wedding was. Uh... Uh, you, you added that to, okay. to the beginning uh, we, after. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Tony had looked at the at the the rush draft, and Tony there were Rascoff. a couple. Yeah, and they're not you, Tony. Her, Tony. Right. Um, at the other Tony, the important Tony. My boss. Um. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the um uh because she who signs the checks is the important Tony. Um. But she had uh, raised a couple of points that she thought needed needed work, and one thing was that she wanted. Uh, uh, more of an introduction that would get people up to speed on who these people are before we jumped right into the action. And we also had the problem that uh, two of the characters who were very important, I think very important to the readers, had gotten married at some point, okay? And they were just married the next time that we saw them. And I have been through not doing important life changes on camera and had fans who have said, <laughs> you are in so much trouble now. Uh, so what I did was I wrote the wedding as the opening scene in the book. So you get to know who the, the, the critical characters who have history from the previous book are. And then you and you also the way that the way that the scene came together, I was able to deal with uh, quite a bit of the the backstory um, that uh, is important not simply for knowing who they are, but because it's part of the springboard for what happens in this book. For example, there's the reference to um, 
Raybert's friend, uh, Fritz, the guy who goes back to get the wedding gown and who's, 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 uh, Chronoport is later lost. And, um, <clears throat> so it was, it, it, it gave us kind of a hook, uh, to start, uh, to start the action with. And if I could pull a few tears while I was doing it, I was not above doing that. Yeah, it's pretty sentimental. Um, and, and cool, but it is, um, the fact that these people have been drawn from time to the 30th century is yeah. that well two of them are actually survivors of a universe that jacob killed i mean that no longer exists um <laughs> yeah. david, david uh, I, I promised that after the valkyrie protocol for at least two books yeah i, I am not going to destroy I know, but i'm keeping an eye on you just in case you know <laughs> Um, yeah, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> but uh, two, two of them are from a universe that died at the end of the Guardian Protocol. Um, four of them are from our own 20th century. Um, and two, Raybert and um, uh, Philo, uh, are native to the 30th century. But Philo is uh, an artificial... Uh, an electronic person, a connectome, who never had a physical existence, a corporeal existence. Um, so it kind of lets you get accustomed to the oddity of the of the character sort. Uh, the fact that Raybert, who is this hulking six foot twelve, you know. Uh, uh, He's, he's a synthoid, you know, a kind of thing. And you find out why he's a synthoid and not the kind of little guy who he was the first time you met him um, in the flesh, as it were, in, in the Gordian Protocol. So there's a lot of... Um, of well, he got, in the setting. Gordian Protocol, he got killed physically and thrown he into did, a he did virtual not get, dungeon he did not get killed he got extracted he got extracted <laughs> yes abstracted. and in the process of extracting a connectome you automatically fry the brain that it came out of it's just one of those unfortunate little side effects you know and then um, he became fertilizer yeah but i gotta <laughs> say that in many ways one of my possibly my favorite single scene from gordian protocol uh was uh jacob's uh rescue of raybert from the from the uh virtual the, uh, prison the charge uh, of the phylos yes the charge of the phylos i mean you've got hundreds hundreds of these hulking red-haired vikings which is how phylos avatar manifests charging over the horizon waving their code burner axes while the the uh, ride of the valkyries plays in the background <laughs> It's just, it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, should we talk about the, um, should we talk about the world or should we dive into the characters? Um, maybe we should. Let's, let's talk about the world a little bit. Yeah. First. Tell us about where we, uh, there's Siska, there's the ad man. Um, there is the fact that um, there has had, there has had to been put into place some protocols for time travel because some bad things happened. Well, I don't know if you consider 15 universes almost getting blowed up and one of them not making it. I guess you could call that a bad thing. Um, yeah, okay. One of the reasons that I wanted to talk about the world first is that I had, when I, when I asked Jacob to collaborate with me on this book, I had a pretty clear notion in my head of what I wanted the societal constructs to be. On, on the two sides, how I wanted them to be organized. And I needed one of them that was going to be the heavy in the first book, but that wasn't really inherently evil. Okay. They were, okay. So I asked Jacob to design the 30th century. And one of the, another reason I asked him to do it is that I have done so many novels and short stories and whatnot at this point that I wanted the 30th century constructed in these books to not be mine, to not have echoes and resonances with a bunch of stuff I've done before. Now, obviously, it's going to have some once I start writing in it. So I told Jacob, I said, go away and build the 30th centuries and build the, the mechanics for time travel because I'm the historian, I'm the, the, the social sciences guy, 
and he is the engineer and the hard sciences guy. So I said, Jacob, go build the 30th century. And he came back to me with something. <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. Yes. Well, tell them about it, Jacob. Well, I, I remember, uh, um, you know, working on it and, you know, you had provided kind of the, um, you know, I, I like to think of it as kind of the picture frame, you know, the, the borders, the, the kind of overall shape that these two, two, two societies were to take and how they would fit into the larger story. And it was my job to fill in that picture, picture frame with uh, all sorts of juicy details, which I did. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I, I remember very clearly when I had my uh, initial design document and I, I'm like, I know what David's going to say to this. He's, he's going he's gonna to tell me that, okay, Jacob, I, I like some of this, but you need to tone down the crazy. But I was like, you know, I'm going to be brave. I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, censor myself. I'm just going to send it to him and, and let the chips fall where they may. And, and dang it, if, if David didn't like pretty much everything that I put into that original document. Um, in terms of the, uh, the Valkyrie protocol, one of the key um, factors that the two societies have is they both have a kind of technological near miss. Um, with um, a kind of uh, industrial, well, one, one is an industrial accident and one is essentially our, our version of Skynet uh, getting loose and, and causing havoc. Um, so they, they both um, approach... Well, let's, let, let's put it this way. In uh, Siskov's universe, uh, English has been heavily influenced by Chinese, okay? And Admin's universe... Not so much, because that's where Skynet got loose. <laughs> and there may have been a, a fierce nuclear bombardment. To put that there could have been, that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't go so well for, for Asia <laughs> in that particular timeline. But in terms of the societal impact, um, both of them approached uh, new technology from a, a cautious perspective. And in uh, the Valkyrie Protocol, we introduce a third society and they don't have that near miss. They have a very optimistic, yes, we can do anything we want with this technology. We are the masters of it. Oops. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> things may, no, may not go according to plan. Mm. Well, admin is the one that uh, they don't allow AIs. They, uh, they do. They do allow AIs, but only if they're firmly enslaved. Mm -hmm. AI, the, the admin are the ones who had the bad experience with Skynet. And so they're like, are you crazy uh, with the, uh, with Siskov's attitude towards, towards AIs? The, the, the president of Siskov in the current book is an electronic person. Okay, and I think she too is uh, never had a corporeal existence before. Mm -hmm. yep. Before she, yeah. You know. um, and the now, uh, the head in, of admin is the is the heavy from the first book. No, no, not the head of admin. The head, okay. uh, the head of their police organization. Ah. Um, uh, specifically, the one that is charged with uh, preventing terrorists and so forth from using time travel. To, the uh, Department to, of Temporal Investigation. Yeah. Basically, what they can do is they have empirical proof that you can't change the past, but they can use time travel to go back and surveil once they realize that something has happened and track down other participants and whatnot who they, they, they can't do anything with them, but they can track them down for future reference, that kind of thing. And as, as, a, as an intelligence tool, the ability to go and look in detail at what happened in the past at the point you might be interested in. I mean, it's obviously it's a huge advantage. Um, the, um, but what I was going to say is in Sis in Siskov's case, it wasn't AI, it was nanotech that got out of control. And so the two societies have different views on what constitutes acceptable tech. I would say that admin 
also is really down on na weaponized nanotech uh, these days because they had a little war with some folks who didn't agree with the technical limits and, and they used nanotech. And it's like, you know, if you get the generation set long on your bazooka shell, it will eat the planet before it stops <laughs> replicating. So maybe it would be a good idea not to use that, you know. Um, but uh, basically, the reason that Shigeki is the is as you say the heavy in the Gordian protocol is twofold one of them is that he is fiercely determined to protect his universe his family which as far as he knows from the way that Raybert introduces this whole concept as far as Raybert knows at the time Shigeki's existence is a result of the accident that has to be undone so if you undo the accident, he ceases to exist, all right? Well, that happens to turn out to be true for that Shigeki, but it turns out that there is another universe which was identical to his up until the moment that the, the problem in Gordian Protocol manifested itself. Mm -hmm. And so that Shigeki is having to interact with characters from Siskov who had to interact with Darth Vader Shigeki, Okay, and and he he understands that the other Shigeki was you know was not a didn't do didn't do nice things where they were concerned, but he doesn't really appreciate the degree to which that scarred some of the people involved. And Jacob, I think it's also fair to say that until Klaus Wilhelm really rubs his nose in it, he's able to say that wasn't me, that was someone else but he is also forced to finally confront the fact that it was him just making a different set of choices in different circumstances. And I yeah. think that's one of the more interesting growth points for him. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, up until that, that point that there is a certain degree of uh, denial uh, mm -hmm. on his part that uh, um, either, you know, looking for holes in the information that, you know, Siskov is providing them. Oh, it's incomplete. You know, there, there must be other factors involved yeah. And you know, that's, that's a, a, a turning point in his character development and his relationship uh, with oh, uh, Klaus Wilhelm. Absolutely. Klaus, is, <laughs> Klaus Wilhelm is a little rocky. <laughs> Klaus Wilhelm is a 20th century character and his uh, wife, and all three of their daughters, his second wife and all three of their daughters, uh, are killed when Admin tries to stop Raybert and the other folks are trying to fix the problem. And his daughters are, they're burned to death, you know, kind of thing. It's, it's horrible. And what happens is yeah, Sh Shigeki is, he says to Klaus Wilhelm, I, I obviously I have, personally offended you in some way what did i do um and claus wilhelm did not have implants when his family was killed but raybert who was there and who witnessed the entire thing did and so there is a recording from raybert's memory that shigeki shares i mean that, that claus wilhelm shares with shigeki and Shigeki sees him cradling his, his, his wife's broken body in his arms. And, she, sa and she, she fought to the last to protect her daughters, you know. And she says, the children, and he says, they're fine. They're fine. You saved them. You can go now. And Raybert is like, let me have her, if I can get her back to my, my chronoport in time and get her into the, the, medic, the automatic, we can, we can save her. And Klaus Wilhelm says, can you save her daughters? And Raybert says, no, it, it's been too long. And he says, then let her go knowing that she saved them. And this is what Shigeki gets from Raybert's recording of it. And Shigeki is basically a good man. And he's looking at what he has what another version of him did. He can't imagine what could possibly have, have, have brought him to order such things, but he knows in, that he did. In a certain way, um, you know, 
uh, Shigeki in the Guardian Protocol is the antagonist because um, he he's you know ultimately trying to protect his family, um, and then the well, there's, there's there's one other point there's one other point that we need to throw in. Um, Shigeki doesn't accept that the only solution is to go back and undo the creation of his universe. He says, we need to look at this. We need to think about it. And Raybert is saying, you're running out of time and the event is getting stronger and harder to undo. So Shigeki isn't saying flat out, my universe's 2000 years of existence be everything blows up is worth the life of 15 other universes. He is like, you know, my universe deserves the opportunity to survive if we look at this and find a way to fix it other than simply wiping us from the face of, of existence. I'm sorry, Jacob. I just, I meant to make that point earlier because I think it goes to how a basically good, very protective person could, oops, that was, mm. uh, <laughs> hi guys. Um, <laughs> The but I think I think it goes to the the uh, um, explaining how somebody who is a good loving father or this or that all the other. Well, I mean, before we I, we we should we should bracket this uh, description of his character by just saying exactly what's going on here, which is that. Um, in the Gordian Protocol, people going back in time thought that they weren't changing anything, yeah. but they were changing things. They were branching. They were creating branch universes. Well, the, at, the at the time, at the time that at the time ahead. that Shigeki gets the message from Raybert, they don't know about alternate universes. What they know is that they have had uh, the the theory says unless you're listening to to Chen, you know, kind of thing. The theory says you know you can't change the past. Okay, and they've hundreds of times they've gone back. They've done things like uh, moving the entire library of Alexandria to the 30th century. And mm -hmm. when they go back, the library's still there. All the people that they killed in the process of and they didn't just sneak in and move it. No, they came in with Gatling guns and said, "No, you can't stop us." You know, because they knew that anybody they killed would never even have been hurt as soon as they left, and the temporal inertia reset itself and none of it would have happened so none of these people who they were hurting actually experienced the hurt at all okay that's that's what and and experience had demonstrated that this was correct they could go back and look and there was never a change um unfortunately that was because the change wasn't occurring in their past it was branching off into another universe if it was significant had a significant impact a sufficient impact uh, small there's changes. only like so far we've only know there's like 13 of these things that got started, um, right? that yeah was... there, there are probably more but um, Jacob established uh, a fairly high threshold uh, for the amount of change that has to be introduced before the universe kind of just flows back together uh, and keeps going in which case you're right all the people you killed didn't didn't stay dead. Um, the, the, the idea of going back and raping and pillaging and using people still seems a little bad, even if... Well, if reset. you're going back just at raping and pillaging, yes. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> you want to tell them about Lucius? <laughs> you invented Lucius. You told uh, about Lucius. I did. I did. <laughs> no, this is the true uh, bad guy. That oh, yeah. In, in yeah, this is, the, this is the zero redeeming <laughs> characteristics character. <laughs> well, maybe let's, let's talk oh, a little bit that, more. Come, come, come Before you get to Lucius, you want to go uh, ahead with Lucius? Okay. Well... Okay, I think it's appropriate, Jacob. Well, talk about what art is and and Theodora and what and 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 set him up as as the the culture he's in Scott in and such as well. Okay. Um, so art? we have the uh, art, the Antiquities Rescue Trust, and you know during you know before the Gordian Protocol, the 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 law rather than the book. Um, came into effect, uh, they handled most of the time travel in Siskov. And, you know, their responsibility was to, you know, go back in time to 
um, you know, uh, bring, uh, kind of shine light on the, you know, uh, mysteries. Uh, lost in, treasures, in, yeah. You know, to bring back the, the, you know, the lost uh, relics, to, you know, uh, learn about these historical figures. Uh, in some cases, they would just pluck these historical figures and bring them to the 30th century. Um, because the or, historical character was still there after they had brought him here. Yeah. And, uh, like, for instance, Samuel Pepys. Yes, yeah. Samuel yeah. Pepys. Who's, if they'd uh, only known what they were getting into. <laughs> yeah, who at the beginning of the Valkyrie Protocol is kind of just sitting in a nice... Uh, little uh, interview room slash cottage in one of their, um, their uh, establishments and uh, uh, waiting for his exit interview. And that's where uh, Theodore Beckett uh, yeah. meets up with him. And Te Te go, go ahead, ahead go ahead. No, go ahead. And Theodora, um, she uh, feels like there's, you know, she, she has a, a tremendous sense of, of guilt that she's uh, struggling tell, with. Yeah, tell them about uh, the library, because that, I think, is key to really understanding Theodora. Well, yeah, she, uh, she was a key figure in the, um, uh, the quote-unquote Alexandria uh, expedition. And uh, so all those things that, that happens where, you know, the quote unquote demons showed up and ransacked the, the great library and you know these strange flying shapes just spat fire and disintegrated um, you know all these troops that were trying to you know uh, converge on the great library. Got and killed um, all the scholars in the library when yeah. they got there, you know. Um, and so she's struggling with you know the realization that that all actually happened, and they, and it they was, sent it back. Was, a, it was sufficient to trigger yeah. a child universe. Yes, and they, they sent back a, a TTV to those coordinates, and ours like you know, hey, we're going to prove that you know this all all this is bupkis, and they go back, and it's like, oh dear, there's there is a universe that branched off of the uh, the the uh, Alexandrian raid. And the scar on that society um, from that event is, is significant. Theodore um, is the most hated woman in the entire history of that. See, they don't know her as an individual, but be, as the guiding force, the command intelligence behind the operation, she is the most hated and reviled individual in the entire history of that timeline. So one of the, I'd say probably the main theme uh, of the book is what price redemption, mm -hmm. and you know, in in a, a and the redemption you know that Theodora is seeking, and um, she sees a uh, uh, an opportunity, a, a way to realize that redemption in her conversations with uh, Samuel Pepys, and it's actually it, it's it's actually Pepys who suggests to her that the possibility of atoning exists uh, when she explains to him what time travel is and how it works and the fact that it turns out you can change the past. He says to her basically, okay, if, if you can change the past, then why not go back and undo some of the great tragedies of history in another timeline where, you know. now there's one point that we missed earlier when we were talking about uh, industry and, and, and art and time travel. And it's actually fairly important uh, in terms of how Siskov avoids the, the problem in, uh, in the Valkyrie uh, protocol, which is that they establish that you cannot travel back to any point within the life experience of someone who was alive at the time time travel was invented. Um, there's like a 50, 60 year window there that's closed. You can't go back into that time because there's no way to protect the privacy of the individuals who are, you know, et cetera. So unless you get, you can get a warrant to go back and look in, t in terms of a specific criminal investigation or something like that. But general time travel in that window is prohibited. 
and that just happens to have protected them against the mistake that our other industrial <laughs> group makes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just wanted to, to, to throw that in because I'd been thinking about it earlier and I was afraid I wasn't going get it, to get it, get it in. But so, so Teodora, now actually I thought uh, while we were, uh, the structure of the way in which the, the proposal that is the cover proposal for what she wants to do is presented to the governing authority. Um, Jacob crafted the original scene and the original arguments. And I thought that she and Lucius had a great argument about, well, we need to do this under controlled circumstances so that we can see what's happening and get a better understanding of the process. Well, all right. So Theodora's boss is Lu Lucius Guan. Yeah. And she yeah. <laughs> wants Lucius to help uh, get the government to allow them to somehow redeem themselves using Peep's plan. E yeah. Um, Lucius is exhibit A of people who go back and rape and plunder in history for fun. Okay. Um, but he claims he's gotten better. Now well, <laughs> he couldn't have got much worse. I mean, you know. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's, he's all better now. Well, okay. <laughs> Jay, there's, Jay, okay. There's all, the only direction from there is up. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, actually, not so much. He proved it could get worse. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, you're right there. Lucius, Lucius is essentially a sociopath um, who is given the keys to the kingdom. As far as he's concerned, the past is kind of the ultimate virtual reality game with the kicker that he knows he's killing real people. Okay, even if they're going to reset and not stay dead, he's killing real people. It's not just like, you know, characters in, in a book. And in theory, when he finds out, he's horrified. My God, what a terrible person I was. Some people believe that. Raybert? How would you say Raybert feels about that, Jacob? <laughs> I would say that Robert uh, feels very strongly yes. <laughs> that he doesn't trust Lucius at all. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, I mean, he's, uh, yeah. Uh, well, Robert Lucius, has good instincts. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Theodora doesn't um, have good instincts. It's because probably because she's so, enmeshed in this this feeling of guilt herself she she couldn't understand how somebody it, well, else it's, it's feel compli it. it's complicated because she and lucius yeah. were lovers before everything blew up oh uh, yeah um and she knew that he did these things in the past she'd never participated in them she kind of closed her eyes to the stories that she was hearing and when he it all hit the crapper and uh art was kicked off of control of time travel and everything else. Lucius, Lucius is really is the, the historical character who he reminds me of the most. And I don't think that he was, this was a deliberate parallel, but who he really reminds me of is Ted Bundy because he can be this absolutely charming, witty, warm puppy dog eyed guy but underneath he is the cold calculating sociopathic sadist okay and, and i think I, one of the if i could just yeah go. throw in one quick point here i think one of the reasons why um theodora uh, uh believes lucius is because uh from her own experiences she's been so impacted by this revelation that she then assumes that the same must be true for Lucius. Well, she certainly, I, I, she assumes she's totally willing to believe that it could be true, which other people who know Raybert aren't. But I think another part, I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right about that. But I think another part of it too is that she needs him to feel the same remorse that she feels on some level. She needs him to feel that, and therefore he is able to convince her that he does. And he's trying to convince everybody 
of that. I've turned over a new leaf. I'm a, I'm a better guy. And he's going through all the right motions. You know, he's doing all the, all the right things. Um, but that's because he's Ted Bundy. He's very smart, uh, very smart, um, and totally amoral. Now, that actually, that's not fair. He's not amoral. He's immoral. Um, and we, we were talking, Jacob and I did uh, Publishers Weekly uh, uh, session earlier today, and we were talking about the fact that for both of us, our really heroic characters, the ones that we consider to be the heroes of the piece, share in common that they're all responsibility takers. And our villains are the folks who don't take responsibility um, or who actively shirk responsibility for selfish personal ends, okay? Theodora is one of our truly heroic characters in a lot of ways. She's a tragic hero in all of this. Lucius is a classic David and Jacob villain, okay? Except I can only think of a couple of villains that I ever built that I was as happy to see die (laughs) as we were to see Lucius die. (laughs) Oh, I was... Okay, normally, normally, um, I'm actually kind of uh, sad uh, when I get to the scene where where the villain gets it. Um, Well, maybe let's... Let's not. I mean, uh, Lucius dies twice, actually, and the, well, the well, we're not, we're not, is... <laughs> we're not, we're not going, we're not going to go into the 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 nature of his death because that would give away too much of the book. Yes, but yeah. I will say that Jacob came up with what is probably uh, on a scale of one to ten. Uh, and 11 on satisfying <laughs> demises for rotten people. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, I worked let's... really hard on that one, David. <laughs> well, you, you, you done good. <laughs> talk any more about the ending of the book. Um, well, it's like, you know. Let's, let, let's talk about what the plan, since we're on the, this sub. So the book is basically two stories mm-hmm. um, that intersect and come together at the end. And this is the third. Theodora, Lucius, um, Belisarius. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so, uh, so their idea is they're going to go back and stop the Justinian plague. They're going to no, they're going to go happening. back and they're going to stop the Black Death, totally, not just the plague of Justinian. They can't stop the very first uh, recorded plague event because they don't know exactly you know where it started or whatever. And this is Peep's idea because he was the guy that, that chronicled the plague when it was in six Yeah, he, he, he lived through the last outbreak of the – actually, no, it wasn't quite the last, but the, the, the last spike of bubonic plague in London and the London fire, which was partly a result uh, of, of the plague. Um, yes. So when they're looking – And, of course, for, we have his famous diaries, which, which – chronicle this among other things and um uh, yeah when he suggests okay we need to do you need to do a good thing to offset the bad things okay this is what they hit on um is that they will prevent the black death the black the, the 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 black death is really in a lot of ways what created the dark ages um because it killed between a third and half the population of Europe. Uh, that was not the plague of Justinian. It was a later uh, manifestation. That was part one of a multi-part interview with David Weber and Jacob Hollow talking about the Valkyrie Protocol. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Here is another entry in David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Salarian League. For hundreds of years they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising Courage. Honor Harrington has worn the Star Kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. 
So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now the Mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. Uncompromising vengeance. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Solarian League, and hell is riding in her wake. And now, David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. Status change, a tracking rating sang out in SLNS Colossus's CIC. He turned to the officer of the watch, his expression tight. Ma'am, the Mantis just translated out. After sitting there all this time, now he suddenly decides to move? Helmet Santini snarled. He'd been just about to step into the shower when the message from CIC reached them. Now he stood in his bathrobe, glowering at Vasiliu's image on his sleeping cabin's comm display. I'm afraid so, sir. Vasiliu looked at something outside his own visual pickup's field of view. They translated out roughly three minutes ago, sir. And at an end space excel of 600 gravities? Santini demanded. He and his staff had decided to assume that base acceleration for their calculations. Another 18 minutes, sir. All right. Spin the generators up for translation 10 seconds after that. Santini smiled thinly. I don't think he's going to want to bring cruisers into energy range of bottle cruisers, even if he can manage to hit his alpha translations that close. So he's going to come back out somewhere in missile range. But if he can get missiles into space and hit us with them in 10 friggin' seconds, we'd better draw up the Articles of Surrender now. The chief of staff's expression showed he wasn't delighted by his admiral's turn of phrase, but he nodded. Yes, sir, I'll see to it. Sixteen minutes later, an immaculately skin-suited Vice Admiral Santini strode onto his flag bridge. Officers and ratings came to attention, but he waved them back to their consoles, crossed to his command chair, and seated himself. Status, Admiral Vasiliu. Ready to hyper in 95 seconds, Vasiliu replied. All ships closed up at battle stations. Good. Santini smiled thinly. I'm looking forward to letting them waste some missiles this time. Yes, sir, and... Hyper footprint, Commodore O'Reilly called out from tactical. Multiple hyper footprints at 2.1 million kilometers. Already? Santini looked down at the repeater deployed from his command chair and frowned. The Mandys had botched their translation badly if they'd been trying to get into range to hit him before he hypered out. In fact, they were well over a million kilometers short of his position. That was still deep inside their missile's range basket. But at that range, flight time would be over 68 seconds, 12 seconds longer than his Nevadas required to translate out from standby readiness. Abort translation, but stand by to reinitiate, he said sharply. Aborting translation, yes, sir, O'Reilly acknowledged, and Santini gave Vasiliu a lopsided smile. It would appear even the vaunted mantis can screw up, he observed. Do you think they'll go ahead and launch? Don't know, sir, the chief of staff replied with an answering smile. Kind of embarrassing for them, I suppose. Santini chuckled, although neither of them really thought the situation was especially humorous. Yes, the mantis had screwed up, but that didn't undo anything that had happened to Admiral Isotalo, whatever had happened to her. Still, at least it gave Santini's task group an opportunity to get a little of their own back. It might be only a moral victory, but the proof to his own people that even Mantis could make mistakes wasn't anything to sneer at after what looked like being yet another debacle after all. Well, keep an eye on them, Santini told O'Reilly. The instant they launch a missile or translate out again, start the generator clock. Yes, sir. In the meantime, I think SLNS Kilkis blew up with all hands. David K. Brown's lax came out of the dark like demons. They'd begun accelerating at a leisurely, for Shrikes, 317.75 gravities the moment they received the code word. At that rate, less than half their maximum excel, and given their stealth systems, they'd been effectively undetectable at any range much above a million kilometers but they'd shut their wedges back down after only 45 minutes. By that time, they'd attained a velocity of 8,143 kps and traveled 11,358,050 kilometers to a point almost exactly 6 million kilometers from Santini's battle cruisers. It had taken them 12 more minutes to enter attack range, and every bit of TG 1027.3's attention 
had been riveted to the maneuvers of the Manticoran heavy cruisers. No one had been looking in exactly the opposite direction for ships they didn't know existed and couldn't have seen if they had been looking. There were only 44 of them, but they streaked in on the non-evading targets they tracked continuously from the moment Brownie deployed them, thanks to the Ghost Rider platform still monitoring the terminus. They knew exactly where their targets were, and they went for the kill without a shred of mercy. Sir Martin Lessam watched the FTL plot as his piranhas swarmed their far more massive foes in a feeding frenzy of destruction. The tonnage imbalance was preposterous. 891,000 tons of lax against 17.3 million tons of Solarian warships, not to mention another 30 million tons of support ships. But tonnage didn't matter. What mattered was surprise, ferocity, and firepower. And the imbalance in those qualities did not favor the Solarian Navy this bloody day. 8,000 kilometers per second was not an enormous closing velocity by the standards of deep space combat, but it was enough for the lax to pass completely through their energy weapons envelope in under two minutes. They opened fire at 500,000 kilometers. 61 seconds later, they passed directly through the heart of what had been Helmut Santini's formation, and those 61 seconds were a minute of unmitigated butchery. In the end, seven of TG-1027.3 and TG-127.4's 50 starships, all destroyers, managed to cycle their hypergenerators and escape before the lax got around to such insignificant fare. A handful of their less fortunate consorts actually survived, albeit with brutal damage, but only because the lax skippers had been tasked to immobilize rather than destroy as many Solarians as they could. They tried hard and did their job well, those skippers, but grazers with that kind of power were not precision weapons. Or rather, they were precision weapons, but it was the precision of a chainsaw, not a scalpel, and their targets were only battle cruisers. A certain amount of breakage was unavoidable. Commodore Lessam watched the carnage, watched the half-dozen Solarian escapees disappear into hyperspace, and heard his flag bridge's cheers. They rang in his ears, and he made himself smile in acknowledgement, but it was hard. Descabello, he'd called it, and he'd been right. It was the perfect battle from his perspective, actually. Not a single manticorn loss, on this side of the terminus at least, in return for total victory. So why did he feel so much more like a butcher than a queen's officer? Maybe Sarah Kate could help him answer that question someday. But someday wasn't this day, and he raised his voice. All right, Randy, that was a beautiful micro jump, but if it's all the same to you, I think we'll just mosey over to the terminus through end space. He showed his teeth and chuckled. I believe we have a few POWs to collect. That was another entry in the complete serialization of Uncompromising Honor by David Weber. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to audible.com and to podcast theme composer, Ruth Jedkowitz. And a Klein's bottle filled with delicious pickled Mobius strips inside an Enigma box, quantumly encrypted with backward clock math and sealed with old combination locks from middle school lockers recently dug up in old Pompeii, Italy. Plus thanks, praise, and gratitude for David Weber, Jacob Hollow, authors of the Valkyrie Protocol. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Mm -hmm.